The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, Chapter 11. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. Edited by Frank Woodworth Pine. Chapter 11. Interest in Public Affairs. I began now to turn my thoughts a little to public affairs, beginning, however, with small matters. The city watch was one of the first things that I conceived to want regulation. It was managed by the constables of the respective wards in turn. The constable warned a number of housekeepers to attend him for the night. Those who chose never to attend paid him six shillings a year to be excused, which was supposed to be for hiring substitutes, but was, in reality, much more than was necessary for that purpose, and made the constableship a place of profit, and the constable, for a little drink, often got such ragamuffins about him as a watch that respectable housekeepers did not choose to mix with. Walking the rounds, too, was often neglected, and most of the nights spent in tippling. I thereupon wrote a paper to be read in Chunto, representing these irregularities, but insisting more particularly on the inequality of the six shillings tax of the constables, respecting the circumstances of those who paid it, since a poor widow housekeeper, all whose property to be guarded by the watch, did not perhaps exceed the value of fifty pounds, paid as much as the wealthiest merchant, who had thousands of pounds worth of goods in his stores. On the whole, I proposed as a more effectual watch the hiring of proper men to serve constantly in that business, and as a more equitable way of supporting the charge, the levying of a tax that should be proportioned to the property. This idea being approved by the Junto was communicated to the other clubs, but as arising in each of them, and though the plan was not immediately carried into execution, yet by preparing the minds of people for the change, it paved the way for the law obtained a few years after, when the members of our clubs were grown into more influence. About this time I wrote a paper, first to be read in Junto, but it was afterward published, on the different accidents and carelessnesses by which houses were set on fire, with cautions against them, and means proposed to avoiding them. This was much spoken of as a useful piece, and gave rise to a project, which soon followed it, of forming a company for the more readily extinguishing of fires, and mutual assistance in removing and securing of goods when in danger. Associates in this scheme were presently found, amounting to thirty. Our articles of agreement obliged every member to keep always in good order and fit for use a certain number of leather buckets, with strong bags and baskets, for packing and transporting of goods, which were to be brought to every fire, and we agreed to meet once a month and spend a social evening together in discoursing and communicating such ideas as occurred to us upon the subjects of fires as might be useful in our conduct on such occasions. The utility of this institution soon appeared, and many more desiring to be admitted than we thought convenient for one company, they were advised to form another, which was accordingly done, and this went on, one new company being formed after another, till they became so numerous as to include most of the inhabitants who were men of property, and now, at the time of my writing this, though upwards of fifty years since its establishment, that which I first formed, called the Union Fire Company, still subsists and flourishes, though the first members are all deceased but myself and one, who is older by a year than I am. The small fines that have been paid by members for absence at a monthly meeting have been applied to the purchase of fire engines, ladders, fire hooks, and other useful implements for each company, so that I question whether there is a city in the world better provided with the means of putting a stop to the beginning conflagrations, and, in fact, since these institutions, the city has never lost by fire, more than one or two houses at a time, and the flames have often been extinguished before the house in which they began has been consumed. 
In 1739, arriving among us from Ireland, the Reverend Mr. Whitfield, who had made himself remarkable there as an itinerant preacher, he was at first permitted to preach in some of our churches, but the clergy taking a dislike to him, soon refused him their pulpits, and he was obliged to preach in the fields. The multitudes of all sects and denominations that attended his sermons were enormous, and it was matter of speculation to me who was one of the number to observe the extraordinary influence of his oratory on his hearers, and how much they admired and respected him, notwithstanding his common abuse of them, by assuring them that they were naturally half-beast and half-devils. It was wonderful to see the change soon made in the manners of our inhabitants. First being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed as if all the world were going religious, so that one could not walk through the town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families of every street. Begin footnote. George Whitfield, 1714-1770, to 1770, a celebrated English clergyman and pulpit orator, one of the founders of Methodism. End footnote. And it being found inconvenient to assemble in the open air, subject to its inclemencies, the building of a house to meet in was no sooner proposed, and persons appointed to receive contributions, but sufficient sums were soon received to procure the ground and erect the building, which was one hundred feet long and seventy broad, about the size of Westminster Hall, and the work was carried on with such spirit as to be finished in a much shorter time than could have been expected. Both house and grounds were vested in trustees, expressly for the use of any preacher of any religious persuasion who might desire to say something to the people at Philadelphia. The design in building, not being to accommodate any particular sect, but the inhabitants in general, so that even if the Mufti of Constantinople were to send a missionary to preach Mohammedism to us, he would find a pulpit at his service. Begin footnote. A part of the Palace of Westminster, now forming the vestibule to the Houses of Parliament in London. End footnote. Mr. Whitfield, in leaving us, went preaching all the way through the colonies to Georgia. The settlement of that province had lately been begun, but instead of being made with hardy, industrious husbandmen accustomed to labor, the only people fit for such an enterprise, it was with families of broken shopkeepers and other insolvent debtors, many of indolent and idle habits, taken out of the jails, who, being set down in the woods, unqualified for clearing land, and unable to endure the hardships of a new settlement, perished in numbers, leaving many helpless children unprovided for. The sight of their miserable situation inspired the benevolent heart of Mr. Whitfield with the idea of building an orphan house there, in which they might be supported and educated. Returning northward, he preached up this charity, and made large collections for his eloquence had a wonderful power over the hearts and purses of his hearers, of which I myself was an instant. I did not disapprove of the design, but as Georgia was then destitute of materials and workmen, and was proposed to send them from Philadelphia at a great expense, I thought it would have been better to have built the houses here and brought the children to it. Thus I advised. But he was resolute in his first project, rejected my counsel, and I therefore refused to contribute. I happened soon after to attend one of his sermons, in the course of which I perceived he intended to finish with a collection, and I silently resolved he should get nothing from me. I had in my pocket a handful of copper money, three or four silver dollars, and five pistoles in gold. As he proceeded, I began to soften, and concluded to give the coppers. Another stroke of his oratory made me ashamed of that, and determined to give the silver, and he finished so admirably that I emptied my pocket wholly into the collector's dish, gold and all. At this sermon there was also one of our club, who, being of my sentiments respecting the building in Georgia, and suspecting a collection might be intended, had by precaution emptied his pockets before he came from home. Toward the conclusion of the discourse, however, he felt a strong desire to give, 
and applied to a neighbour who stood near him to borrow some money for the purpose. The application was unfortunately made to perhaps the only man in the company who had the firmness not to be affected by the preacher. His answer was, At any other time, friend Hopkinson, I would lend it thee freely, but not now, for thee seems to be out of thy right senses. Some of Mr. Whitfield's enemies affected to support that he would apply these collections to his own private emollient, but I, who was intimately acquainted with him, being employed in printing his sermons and journals, etc., never had the least suspicion of his integrity, but am to this day decidedly of opinion that he was in all his conduct a perfectly honest man, and methinks my testimony in his favour ought to have the more weight, as we had no religious connection. He used, indeed, sometimes to pray for my conversion, but never had the satisfaction of believing that his prayers were heard. Ours was a mere civil friendship, sincere on both sides, and lasted to his death. The following instance will show something of the terms on which we stood. Upon one of his arrivals from England at Boston, he wrote to me, that he should come soon to Philadelphia, but knew not where he could lodge when there, as he understood his old friend and host, Mr. Benizé, was removed to Germantown. My answer was, You know my house. If you can make shift with its scanty accommodations, you will be most heartily welcome. He replied that if I made the kind offer for Christ's sake, I should not miss of a reward, and I returned, don't let me be mistaken, it was not for Christ's sake, but for your sake. One of our common acquaintances jocosely remarked that, knowing it to be the custom of the saints, when they receive any favor, to shift the burden of the obligation from off their shoulders and place it in heaven, I was contrived to fix it on earth. The last time I saw Mr. Whitfield was in London, when he consulted me about his orphan-house concern, and his purpose of appropriating to the establishment of a college. He had a loud and clear voice, and articulated his words and sentences so perfectly that he might be heard and understood at a great distance, especially as his auditors, however numerous, observed the most exact silence. He preached one evening from the top of the courthouse steps which are in the middle of Market Street, and on the west side of Second Street, which crosses it at right angles. Both streets were filled, with his hearers, to a considerable distance. Being amongst the hindmost in Market Street, I had the curiosity to learn how far he could be heard by retiring backwards down the street towards the river, and I found his voice distinct until I came near Front Street, where some noise in that street obscured it. Imagining, then, a semicircle of which my distance would be the radius, and that it were filled with auditors, to each of whom I allowed two square feet, I computed that he might well be heard by more than thirty thousand. Thus reconciled me to the newspaper accounts of his having preached to twenty-five thousand people in the fields, and to the ancient histories of generals haranguing whole armies, of which I had sometimes doubted. By hearing him often I came to distinguish easily between sermons newly composed and those which he had often preached in the course of his travels. His delivery of the latter was so improved by frequent repetitions that every accent, every emphasis, every modulation of voice was so perfectly well turned and well placed that, without being interested in the subject, one could not help being pleased with the discourse a pleasure of much the same kind, with that received from an excellent piece of music. This is an advantage itinerant preachers have over those who are stationary, as the latter cannot well improve their delivery of a sermon by so many rehearsals. His writing and printing from time to time gave great advantage to his enemies. Unguarded expressions and even erroneous opinions delivered in preaching might have been afterward explained or qualified, by supposing others that might have accompanied them, or they might have been denied. But, Lettera Scripta Mene, critics attacked his writing, violently, and with so much appearance of reason as to diminish the number of his votaries and prevent their increase. 
so that I am of opinion, if he had never written anything, he would have left behind him a much more numerous and important sect, and his reputation might in that case have been still growing even after his death, as there being nothing of his writing on which to found a censure and give him a lower character. His proselytes would be left at liberty to feign for him as great a variety of excellence as their enthusiastic admiration might wish him to have possessed. My business was now continually augmenting, and my circumstances growing daily easier, my newspaper having become very profitable, as being for a time almost the only one in this and the neighboring provinces. I experienced, too, the truth of the observation, that after getting the first hundred pound, it is more easy to get the second, money itself being of a profitable nature. The partnership at Carolina having succeeded, I was encouraged to engage in others, and to promote several of my workmen, who had behaved well by establishing them with printing-houses in different colonies, on the same terms with that in Carolina. Most of them did well, being enabled at the end of our term, six years, to purchase the types of me and go on working for themselves, by which meant several families were raised, partnerships often finishing quarrel, but I was happy in this, that mine were all carried on and ended amicably, owing, I think, a good deal to the precaution of having very explicitly settled in our articles everything to be done by or expected from each partner, so that there was nothing to dispute which precaution I would therefore recommend to all who enter into partnerships, for whatever esteem partners may have for and confidence in each other at the time of the contract, little jealousies and disgusts may arise with ideas of inequality in the care and burden of the business, etc., which are attended often with breach of friendship and of connection, perhaps with lawsuits, and other disagreeable consequences. End of chapter 11